the defense tournament is over. 30,000 viewers, that was kind of the biggest thing in Dota 2 for you, wasn't it? Um, the international, of course, would always have to take the cake, but it was kind of pretty cool to have that many people watching an online tournament, because that hasn't happened in Dota 1 at all for an online tournament. Those viewer numbers, have, we've never reached that. And Dota 2, and if you actually combine all the streams, we hit, we hit about 48,000 at the, at the highest peak for all the streams. And we even had a guy casting from Kazakhstan, we had a secondary English stream. Yeah, we, there was a lot of people broadcasting that match. Like, as far as the first grand final for the defense, to have it go until the final match, it was like, hell yes, this is the best thing we could have asked for. It was a long time, but luckily I had Cinder in here live in the studio with me, and we did our first little two-hour cap before we started off, so we kind of made it longer for ourselves, but it was all, it was all worth it. Um, the only time I've ever cast with Cinder in, in a local environment was at DreamHack. And that was for a short time. He was playing, so I couldn't always have him commentate with me. Uh, before that, actually, I haven't cast a LAN event with him. I've tried a couple of times, but it's either he's got studies or he's playing, so... Um, Valve support, I couldn't grade it any higher. Like, the second the issue happened, we contacted the Valve guys, and they actually set up a private server just so we could play the game. And when that happened, we're just like, what? Are serious? It's like, that's cool, man. Um, so yeah, it, it was a big problem. It's not really something which, that, like they know it's a problem in the beta that the game can get over, over spiked by too many people trying to connect to Dota TV. Of course, it basically goes straight onto the same server box as the game is hosted. So it's a complete overload for them. It's like DDoSing, but it's just on a Dota level. Um, so yeah, when they, when they completely changed it up, set it up for us, and we ran smoothly ever since that point. The fourth game, there was some problem with the, with the re-hosting kind of stuff. What was that about? <laughs> yeah, there was, there, was, there was a couple of bugs. Um, because Valve had never done anything like that before. To set up a private server and then have it hosted this way, that kind of stuff didn't really happen before, let alone having to re-host the game. So yeah, we had a couple of things where people were having to wait 150 seconds before they could respawn. And the, of course, everybody knows it, courier moment, um, which was pretty freaking hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> but w when you looked at it at that point, like we, we kind of knew by the time the game went down, and it was the reason why Miguel from Quantic said, we will forfeit this if we can't get the reload to work, because they realized they were out. And then they did some amazing plays when Navi did some stupid plays, and they brought themselves back into the game, but it still wasn't enough. So, at the end of the day, it didn't really change anything, but I give every, everybody a good laugh at the end of the games. It's, it's just any mage can't get to a high enough strength in enough time. And it's the reason why we saw when Havorce played uh, anti-mage, he tried to go for the hand of Midas, because he realized that he needed farm fast, and he needed late game items fast. But even then, that wasn't enough time, because we saw Quantic push in, even like at the 18 minute mark, they entered the main base. And Na'Vi just didn't have enough to counter that push. And that was their biggest problem. And it's always the biggest problem whenever anybody plays anti-mage. It just takes too long to get through a game. Like the European scene is all about the push these days. We were casting um, the Razor Dota 2 tournament from Singapore um, earlier this morning, in fact, about 30 minutes ago. And uh, you just see a completely different style. These guys are a lot slower. They will pick heroes like Spectre. They will pick heroes like anti-mage because they know they have enough time to farm, and up, farm them up. But if they go up against a European team, they will find no time at all for that. There was always some kind of difference between European Dota and Asian Dota, and that's mainly because the Europeans prefer to be more excited when they play games. They get bored very, very quickly, where Chinese and the rest of Southeast Asia are just like, you know what, we can farm, it's cool, I'm happy doing this, I play this like so many hours a day, farm's fine. Um, so they, they don't really care, uh, because it's whatever wins them the game. And that's, that's the strat they look at, where the Europeans are like, we force you, we make you play our style, and we play an exciting style. So the Europeans are always very entertaining to watch. The Chinese are more of those ones where you're going to watch the very precise movements of every single hero. At that point, then you go on, hell yeah, this is actually really an awesome game, but you've got to respect it for being a different type of quality. In Dota 2, yes. But that's because um, the Asian teams don't really look at Dota 2 right now. Like, there's a couple who are trying to focus on it a little bit more, but they've got a lot more research to do about it. They've got to look at the metagame a lot closely, um, and they've got to practice more on the client, because it's, it's a different way of playing. Like, Warcraft 3 playing as well as Dota 2 playing in the Valve game, it's very, very different. Like, it's, it's not one of those things where it'll take you years to understand what the hell's going on if you transition. It'll take you about a grand total of one week worth of playing. But it's one of these things where I don't think they're really adapted to the world of Dota 2, both in draft as well as game.
what does it need to, to get the Asians over to Dota 2? Um, either insanely high speed internet going around every single part of Asia or land mode. Either will work. Asia live out their land cafes. It's not like Europe or America where they will generally have a good high quality internet where they can have like at least one megabit down. It's like, oh, that's amazing. Um, Asia doesn't have that. And most Asians don't really have a computer which is capable of running Dota 2. So they have to go to the LAN cafes. And then even the LAN cafes will have to upgrade all their hardware so they can play Dota 2. So there's a lot of things which need to be done for Asia to, to transition forward. But that's something which, well, all the Asian companies need to look at and also Valve need to support. Like the Razer competition, we're playing on US West servers because it's taking way too long for a Singapore server to be found properly. So they're having some issues. There's already a little bit of overload down there. But yeah, it's, it's just one of these things where it's got to be worked through. It's bit by bit, solve each problem as it turns up. Um, but yeah, it's, it's already looking pretty good down there. And now with Eric Johnson, um, who said that land mode will be included in the game, it's just like, hell yes, it is possible for Asia to really like flourish with Dota 2. How much do you look forward to finally some more Dota 2 action offline? Um, I can't look forward to it a lot. I, I love LAN events. I love going to LAN events all the time. Um, hopefully this time I get there. Uh, the Star Championship, which was played in Kiev, I was meant to be there, but had visa issues, so I never got there. Um, but this time I hope to be there for the Star Ladder. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really good that um, the Vlad and all the guys down on Cyber Arena and the Star, and the Star Ladder, um, they really push this kind of stuff. They make it so LAN is important. And it is. They've got an awesome facility in the Cyber Sports Arena, so why wouldn't you? Uh, but yeah, LAN events are always so much better and it really, it's, it's kind of like this thing where the Dota community can come out of their hiding and instead of just playing in their little dark corner, they can show the world who they are. Um, as far as an offline tournament, probably not. Uh, offline tournaments do cost a lot of money to run, so I don't know if we're ever going to go down that path. As far as covering them, hell yeah. Um, as far as running them, probably not. Online is where we have already had some good success, so we'll probably just stick with that. Maybe, maybe something about Berlin. I mean, you have come now here for like a bit more than half a year, I think, like uh, summer, yeah, summer of last year. I moved here in June, beginning of June or something like that, yeah. How do you like Berlin after now? Berlin's pretty cool. Um, i got to say I don't see much of it. Um, I'm a little bit of a hermit when it, when it comes down to things. I live out of um, the wonderful world of the interwebs. For a lot of people who watch my stream, they realize I stream almost daily. Uh, so there's not really a lot of time to do a lot of other things. So I don't, I don't get out much, but I kind of like it that way. I, I enjoy my job. I live through my job. So yeah, it's, it's a good kind of world. I do plan on one point to see a lot more of Berlin, but it's on the to-do list. <laughs> How's your germ right now? Um, <laughs> it's <just> not good. <laughs> it is not good. Um, I know some things enough to order a donor, and that's basically it. <laughs> Berlin also had like it's like for StarCraft 2 it's like the the host city of Barcraft stuff kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see something like that for Dota 2 as well? Of course, of course, that kind of stuff would be pretty awesome. Um, I would be interested to know who would turn up to that. Um, I'd also probably say my skills wouldn't really be that necessary because everyone would be like, "Hey, I want a German caster for that one." Um, but yeah, I'd I'd really be interested to see uh, if if it does start to kick off. Um, I know there's a couple of groups already in America who have been like, hey, let's let's do this. Like, the, we've, we've got to get some Dota Craft or whatever the hell it's called. Um, they're trying to work out a name for it and get it to happen. I think, yeah, that'd be awesome. Like, at this point, there's a couple of people out there who already run parties for Dota for the Dota events. We had a lot of people post up even pictures for the of the parties they had for the Defense Grand Final. I'm like, that's awesome. I love it. So yeah, I, I think I think it'd be possible. We now have with the with the latest patch five bands. How do you think this will going to change the whole metagame? You know, I'm actually waiting to see that in during the Dignitas Cup because for me, I think that's going to be a big, um, a big teller for just what teams do with that extra ban. It's always been one of these things where you can bait out either an Invoker pick or a Profit pick because you only had the two bans to start with and now there's three, so those heroes won't come in. So it's going to come out to a lot of pit teams having more diversity because all those big heroes will not, will not make it through the pool. And a lot more teams will probably not get as risky as they normally do with a ban like a Venomancer or a Windrunner very early on so they can bait out the Prophet and Invoker or something like that. It's going to be a, 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 different, a different ballpark game when it comes to the Captain's Mode. You talked about how Dota 2 is different to Dota 1 in the, in the handling and the movement. Mm -hmm. um, which heroes does it favor? 
Um, I know it doesn't favour Puck, and Kev will tell you that to all the extents of his life. Um, I don't know as far as what heroes would favour. i got to say Invoker is a lot easier to control, uh, and that's mainly because you can customise every single hockey in the world for him. So whatever you want to do with him, you can do. Uh, as far as, like, it's just a general feeling for all heroes. Like, every single key is customisable. There's no war keys. It's built into the game. you got no real glitches with that kind of stuff. Um, I wouldn't really say, for me, it favours one hero to work a lot easier, but I think it, as far as, like, your brain processing it, it makes it a lot simpler and makes it very easier to play. Yeah, with with Tiny and uh, Juggernaut, we're, uh, we're, we're like the, the, the both the two heroes and, and last from last week which came up. Juggernaut is a CLG only hero. Loader is just taking that under his wing and saying Juggernaut is the best. Um, Juggernaut is good if he gets farm, but he requires a lot of support to do so. So he's a risky hero to play against a lot of the top teams. But CLG seem to be pulling it off. So he might appear here and there, but I, I hardly doubt he's going to become mainstream. Tiny, however, hell yes he will. Um, he was before, uh, and then just went out of phase because everyone just kind of went from the whole burst ganking thing to pushing kind of thing to we want to have a push with a bit of gank. Um, and now Tiny, they, everyone's using his toss to try and bring down towers faster, and they realise he's actually a really, really fast, good pusher. So he's working perfectly into the whole meta game. So yeah, Tiny will be a consistent pick, um, and we'll see it tonight and tomorrow where Tiny will just never make pa make it past the ban pull or pick pull. He'll always be included somewhere. Well, I kind of like Mouse Balls' lineup because they always go gank with push. And when that happens, it works nicely. The, the whole blinking Shadow Shaman is not really something new um, because it was done many, many times in the world of Dota 1. But they've managed to bring it back in again and it, and it worked out nicely for them. Of course, Sing Sing being the main Shadow Shaman player um, or Rasta, whatever, yeah. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people really enjoy watching that kind of style. It makes it very entertaining to watch. But I don't think Mouse Sports have shown everything they've actually got up their sleeves yet. Like they've, they were really impressed with themselves about the Tiny Strap because they're the first ones ever to do it during the Dota Replays Brawl. So they were like, yeah, we are awesome. I remember Dement sent me a lot of messages, uh, messages that night. Um, but yeah, it was, I, I think Mouse will have a lot more to show. Um, and the more teams like Mouse Sports who try and think outside the box a little bit, the, the more interesting our game gets. I have no rhythm at all. I, I will wake up in the mid-afternoon. I will then come to the studio mm -hmm. and broadcast, and then I'll go home and I'll upload VODs until about 5 a.m. in the morning, and I'll do the rest of my work while I'm uploading VODs. But, yeah, I try and keep up to date with as much as possible. But, yeah, there's just so much to do that you just run out of time. So, yeah. And when you have weekends like this, on Monday I'm going to be wrecked. Like, I'm, I think I can sleep for about maybe three hours this evening, um, and then we're casting straight again. So we're all those people who watch the stream and they see the bags under the eyes. There's a reason for that. At the same finals, you won't be able to sw to skip, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I only need a couple of cans of Red Bull to get through that. <laughs> Do you have some kind of bad habits in the studio or something like that? Um, I wouldn't say it's a bad habit, because luckily there's nobody else in the studio when I'm in there. Uh, but I generally cast with no shoes on. That's the only weird thing that I do. Um, apart from that, no, I, I don't think so, no. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't really notice my own bad habits. <laughs> Thank you for the interview. Yep.